neck, reinforced from head to shoulders by overlapping muscle-wrapped neck ribs. Jurassic reinforcing rod. The Chinese Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology in Beijing houses an extraordinary find. A single neck rib excavated from the Gobi Desert in 1987 measures over four meters, longer than a standard car. Imagine the neck, an estimated 13 meters long. Stiffening made the neck less flexible. The Menchisaurus could move it up or to the side, though just 30 degrees. It could never lift it vertically into trees. Nature's elaborate structure restricted her creature's movement. Dale Russell asks, Why uh, was the neck so long? What did the animal use it for? And one way, which is very obvious, is it was a labor-saving device. Without moving its enormous elephantine body, it could swing a very light neck over a broad arc and eat food from a, a very broad uh, range of grazing material. How to support such a neck? Working with Diplodocus tracks near Colorado's Purgatoire River, Dr. Martin Lockley. We know from the skeletons that the animals had a long tail, but they must have held it up because there's no, there's no sign of a tail drag going along here, so they, they held it up off the ground. I think it must have been a, a counterbalance to some extent for the long uh, they had long necks, had long necks, and they had long tails. And the rest of the body in the middle is central and, and symmetrical. So it's kind of uh, like a, like I said, it's a counterbalance. Some people have compared it with uh, with the architectural construction of, of, of a bridge, like a suspension bridge. Suspension bridges of sinew and bone. 150 million years old. The bridge model fits most sauropods, such as Diplodocus. The bridge's strength depends on the strength of its cables. And it was precisely that, a cable, which helped many sauropod dinosaurs hold their ends up. Hips of a Diplodocus are equivalent to suspension bridge towers. Its cable, a massive sinew running the length of the back, was housed in a groove on top of the vertebrae. Function determines form. This model holds for most sauropods, but what if one evolved separately on an isolated continent, China, in Jurassic times? For Mementosaurus, the suspension bridge model doesn't hold. So how did Mementosaurus support its neck? To solve this structural design problem, Yamasaki consults bridge construction company engineer Takashi Yasumoto. To fit Mementosaurus, the bridge model must be skewed. Sinew supported one third of its neck. But there were no massive sinews running forward. This is where the long neck ribs come in. Meter for meter, muscle-bound neck ribs may have made its neck lighter than other sauropods. Other species had cable-like sinews, says Yamasaki. Mementosaurus evolved neck ribs instead. 
Here's how it worked. When this bamboo blind falls open, we get a long, light rod, which you can easily support from one end. Mementius R. Nex must have been something like this. The model resembles strong, light, split cane fishing rods. The Science and Engineering Museum, Chengdu, home to Mementosaurus. And to Professor Dong Ziming, China's foremost dinosaur hunter. Excavated in 1957, this fossil brought Mementosaurus to world attention. Of six known individuals, this is the most complete. Just one vital thing was missing. Professor Dong holds the world record for finding new dinosaur species, but he has a confession. When we found this Mementosaurus, Dong says, the skull was missing. This is a reproduction, a Diplodocus head. We know this one's wrong. We're going to correct it. North China's Gobi Desert, a forbidding wasteland and a treasure trove for Jurassic fossils. Chinese and Canadian scientists have been digging here since 1986. The Joint Dinosaur Project was an outstanding success. Never had there been such a sustained search for remains. Among those treasures, a precious, elusive, Mementosaur jaw. The lower jaw held 16 teeth teeth which convinced scientists that Mementosaurus was indeed different. The evidence was conclusive. Mementosaurus was not directly related to Diplodocus and its kin. Teeth are important in classifying dinosaurs. Diplodocus had peg-like ones. But Mementosauruses resembled spoons. Ironically, Filling in missing information made the animal even stranger. On top of this dinosaur quarry, the Zhigong Dinosaur Museum in Qichuan. The Menchisaur teeth occluded badly, says museum director Hui Yuyang. It used its teeth like scissors to cut leaves. The Zhigong Museum collection gives clues about the shape of Mementosaur's skull, its jaw movements, the position of eyes, nostrils, and so on. This information lets the past take shape in a computer. Like T-Rex, Mementosaur's skull combined hollow spaces with bone to reduce weight. Now, to flesh out the bones, the apertures in front of the eyes are nostrils. Mementosaurus could not grind leaves with a simple jaw which moved only up and down. The shape of its teeth confirms that. A long extinct plant, Benetites, was a staple in sauropod diets. In Jurassic times, Benetites grew in conditions not unlike the modern Gobi Desert, hot and dry. It grew about three meters high, just right for Mementosaur heads. A picture starts to come together of an animal so massive that it had to swing a long neck rather than shift a huge body. Plant fiber is hard to digest. To grind it down, 
Modern mammals chew leaves over and over with molar teeth, which Mementosaurus didn't have. These teeth only cut. After that, the animal pushed unchewed leaves down its throat with its tongue. That explains why sauropods ingested stones to grind plant fibers for them. At Brigham Young University, Dr. Wade Miller. So these gastrolus or stomach stones are used in a grinding motion as these things continually move around by muscle contractions and enable the sauropod dinosaurs to grind their food to macerate the cellulose material of the plants in order to gain the food value that they need from the plants that they're eating. Some birds, which have no teeth, still do the same, swallowing stomach stones deliberately to grind tough fiber for them. Fiber wears down. So do stones. Gastroliths found with sauropod bones are usually smooth and rounded. Dr. Miller. Even before that, once the gastroliths grind the food down to a certain size, the bacteria within the animal that must have existed would also be a help that was necessary in gaining the food value the dinosaur needed. And so bacterial colonies within the digestive system would also help by fermentation and uh, producing the necessary food value for the dinosaur. Microbes help break down food in animals' guts. In plant-eating dinosaurs, they were crucial. An elegant experiment at Koshain University shows why sauropod dinosaurs became so large. For two months, these tadpoles ate spinach. This group ate only worms. Plant-fed tadpoles, like the one on top, grew twice as large as protein eaters. Plant eaters needed more microbes, and hence, longer guts, to process plant fiber. Which takes us back from tiny tadpoles to the 25-ton monster, Mementosaurus. The belly of this beast, the length of its gut anyway, may have been 10 times that of the animal itself, full of microbes fermenting plant leaves, generating heat. And on this rib, you can see, you can see one, two, three, excavations that pass well into the interior of the rib. At the Museum of Western Colorado, Dr. Brooks Britt studies sauropod cooling systems. These Apatosaurus bones are full of natural cavities. With virtual compost heaps generating heat in their guts, sauropods, it seems, were air-cooled. It's important to remember here that even though we're showing a lot of separate balloons to represent air sacs, all these were interconnected. There was a big tube running down through here that was thicker than my arm, and it came down and connect, went into here, and went into here, and then this flowed up along the side of the vertebra up into all these different areas. So, what have we got? 25-ton adult mementosauruses, fueled by inefficient, microbe-fired plant fiber, fermenting in huge air-cooled guts. What sort of lung sustained this beast? At Purdue University, Dr. Richard Hengst, with artificial neck and oil drum lungs, is trying to find out. 6.25. Hard work, but air had to pass in and out along a 13-meter neck. Nine drums hold 1,900 liters of air. In using what we've seen here, we find that about 800 liters per minute is about what Mementosaurus could get to its lungs. And that isn't a lot of oxygen. And therefore, even at a low metabolic rate, Mementosaurus breathing through its nose could probably only move very, very slowly. So it would have to open its mouth. And even then, it's going to be difficult to